Hello, Michael. Hello. Today, uh, we have a question that says, uh, on one hand, Bhagavan tells us, don't believe what you don't know. But on the other hand, it is advised to believe, even though it's not our direct experience, that this world is a dream of ours and that everything that is going to happen to us is predestined in order for us to try not to pursue happiness outside and to turn within more easily. How can we reconcile this if we cannot know it? Do we have to stick to our experience to believe only what we know experientially? Or can we assume the truth of some ideas that we don't experience yet, like an aid for us in the spiritual path? Is this a contradiction? Um, yes, Bhagavan did often say, don't believe what you don't know. This is, we can say, this is a very high ideal. Um, it, because there is only one thing that we know for certain, and that is I am. We, I, I am, when we say I am, we are talking both about our existence and by implication also our awareness of our existence. Our existence and our awareness of our existence are not two things, they're actually one and the same. But even to us, they may seem to be different. If, even if they're two different things, they're two things which, uh, they are the only two things that we can be absolutely sure about. That is, we couldn't be aware of anything if we didn't exist. So we must exist. And um, if we were not aware, we wouldn't be aware of anything. So we must be aware. But as I say, existence and awareness actually are one and the same thing. So that I am is the only thing that we know for certain. Everything else that we know are objects perceived by us. They're things other than ourselves. Uh, that's not, I'm not talking only about the, the physical objects of the world, even the subtle objects of our, within our mind, the thought, feelings, I, ideas, memories, perceptions, hopes, fears, everything, all are things other than ourselves. They're all objects experienced by us. So they could all be illusory. In fact, according to Bhagavan, they are all illusory because they appear only in the view of ego. Um, so don't believe what you don't know. Ultimately, it means the only thing we know for certain is I am. We shouldn't, we should not be concerned about anything other than I am. So if we could if we could cling firmly to I am and totally ignore all other things, then only we can truly um, follow this instruction of Bhagavan, don't believe what you don't know. As soon as our mind comes out, we see this world of multiplicity and it seems to us to be real. Why? Because now we take this body to be ourself. What is actually real is only ourself. Since we take the body to be ourself, since we are real, the body also seems to be real. And since the body is a part of this world, the whole world seems to be real. That is why even when we're dreaming, so long as we're dreaming, the dream world, dream body and dream world seem to be perfectly real. Only when we leave that dream and come to this dream, are we able to recognize, oh, that was just a dream. It was just our own mental creation. We can see that uh, the, the body and world that seemed to be real uh, were not actually real. They were just our, uh, fabric, men, our own mental fabrications. Um, so when we allow our mind to go outwards, we are aware of so many things. And um, we... We cannot in practice live without belief. We always believe something. What does belief mean? We take something to be true. So in order to, um, to operate in this world, we have to take some things as true. Uh, otherwise, uh, we, 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 couldn't, uh, we couldn't survive in this dream world of ours. We, we have to take something to be true. We, we believe that if we eat food, it will nourish us. If we drink water, it will quench our thirst. It's because it seems to be so. So we, but it, we, as I say, nothing is absolutely certain except I am. So in effect, we, we all believe things. Um, but so how can we apply Bhagavan's instruction, don't believe what you don't know, 
when we our mind is going outwards and we are operating in this world, the only way we can apply it is by keeping our beliefs to a minimum and believe the only things that are essential to believe. Um, uh, because we don't actually know anything other than I am for sure. Um, regarding the examples you gave, um, the first one was, um, it is advised to believe, even though it's not our experience, that this world is a dream. There are two possibilities. Either this world is a dream or it's not a dream. If it if it's a dream, that means it doesn't exist independent of our perception of it. If it is something other than a dream, that means it exists independent of our perception of it. There is absolutely no evidence that it does exist independent of our perception of it. That is, whatever we experience in our present state, we could equally well experience in a dream. So to believe that this is not a dream is we, are, we have to believe in a lot. We have to believe that there's actually a world external to ourselves. To accept that it's most probably just a dream is we, 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 are, we are believing in much less. We don't believe that anything is existing independent of our perception of it. In other words, taking this world to be a, uh, a, um, a dream is more akin to a state of non-belief than a state of belief. Taking it to be real, taking it to be out there, we are believing in things that we don't at all know. That is, how can we know that anything exists independent of our perception of it? If we believe this is not a dream, we are assuming that this world exists independent of our perception of it. Um, so it's always better when we, we have to believe something, we can't totally avoid until we unless we turn except when we turn within and cease attending to anything other than ourselves. We we are forced to believe one thing or another. Um, it is better to believe the simpler things because the simpler things are always more likely to be true. That is, if this is just a dream, that's a very simple explanation of everything. If this is not a dream. Then there are so many things to be explained. Then we need science, we need history, we need geography, we need all these. We need to know so much about this world and we need to believe so many things for which we have no evidence. Because ev science seems to be based on evidence, but there's a science is based on a metaphysical assumption that this world, that this is not a dream, but this world exists independent of our perception of it. Though within this dream, there may seem to be evidence for all the uh, findings and theories of uh, science, they are all based upon uh, uh, an assumption for which there is no evidence. That assumption is the assumption that this world exists independent of our perception of it. If it doesn't in exist independent of our perception of it, in other words, if it's just a dream, then all our science is meaningless. It may seem within this dream, our science may seem to give us so many comforts and conveniences. We've got, uh, we, 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 um, we can, uh, we have got warm clothing, we can keep, heat our houses, we can build houses and uh, keep ourselves, protect ourselves from the elements. We can, nowadays, we, our science has become so advanced, it's developed so much technology, which is very convenient for us. We've got PCs and all these things. It all seems very real, so long as we are dreaming this dream. But if all this is a dream, all, our, all the science within the dream is is ultimately meaningless. It, it's true as far as, to the extent that the dream seems to be real, but the dream science also seems to be real. And it seems to give us a uh, dream comforts, but it's all just a dream, according to Bhagavan. That is the most, that is the simplest thing to believe. It's also the most probable uh, thing to be true because always simpler, a simpler explanation is more likely to be true than a complicated explanation, because a complicated explanation makes more assumptions than a simpler explanation. 
So the more assumptions you make to build your belief system, the more likely you are to be wrong. So the fewer the assumptions, the, the more likely what you believe uh, is, the more likely it is to be true. Therefore, this is a, what Bhagavan said, don't believe what you don't know. It may not be possible to apply it 100% in all circumstances, but the more we apply it, it, it saves us from, from so many uh, false and unnecessary assumptions. In a, in a way, uh, we could say that science uh, uh, are facts about this dream. I mean, uh, yeah, yes, we yes. Can, uh, I mean, if, if you try the same thing over and over again, it's, it works the same way. So we could be yeah. say it's, it's yeah. a fact. I mean, it's no, we can it's, deny it, that. It, yeah, just but like this, it's just like this, the nature, the real nature yeah. of the. Uh, mm -hmm. So long as this world seems to be real, science will also seem to be real. And how long will this world seem to be real? So long as we take this body to be I, the world will seem to be real, and therefore the science will seem to be real. But the operative word is seem to be. Just because it seems to be real, it doesn't mean it is real. So science is, a, is a, all the knowledge we have built up about this appearance. Uh, now there appears to be a world. There seems to be a world. So we are investigating this appearance. And the more we investigate it, the more we, the more mysterious it seems to become. Before, before the, a few hundred years ago, a solid object was a solid object. There was no question about it. A rock was a rock, a table was a table. But now the science has become so sophisticated, but it, it understands all these seemingly solid materials. They are just a, a particular uh, uh, configuration of energy. Th that energy um, we conceptualize as, uh, as nucleus and as, a, as a atoms consisting of a nucleus with protons and neutrons and atoms whizzing around it. And we, we conceptualize these as tiny little particles. But even to think of them as particles is not true. They behave in some circumstances, they seem to behave like particles. In some circumstances, they seem to be behave like just like waves. So the more we, the deeper and deeper we go into investigating objects, the more objects we find, but, and the more, com the more obscure and complicated the whole thing seems to be. Um, <clears throat> we can never find the truth by investigating objects, because if you investigate an object, however deeply you investigate it, you will only find more objects. In order to find all objects exist only in the view of a subject. So objects depend for their seeming existence upon the seeming existence of the subject. So subject comes first, objects comes next. So the, the subjects have a base, the, the ground on which all objects appear. So if we want to go find the truth behind both the objects and the subjects, we should, shouldn't investigate the objects as science tries to do. We should investigate the subject. Who am I? To whom do all these things appear? We have to turn our attention back towards ourselves. As I say, if we investigate objects, we find only more objects. If we investigate the subject, the subject itself will disappear. And what, what lies behind the subject is only pure awareness. That is what we actually are. And that alone is the reality of the subject and consequently the re reality of all objects. Because the objects, the objects borrow their semi existence from the subject, and the subject borrows its semi existence only from that pure awareness. So that is the ultimate reality. So, in order to find what is ultimately real, we need to turn our attention away from all objects. As Bhagavan says in verse 16 of Upadeshundiya, Beli Vide Angale Vittu, leaving all external phenomena, objects. Um, the mind knowing its own form of light, its own form of light means the fundamental awareness I am. That is real awareness. So 
that is what we need to do. That is why Bhagavan said, don't believe what you don't know, because what we know for sure, the only thing that we, 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 cannot, that we cannot reasonably doubt is I am. Because even to doubt I am, we must exist. So uh, it, it's the one thing we cannot reasonably doubt. We can reasonably doubt everything other than I am. So, so putting our trust in I am, believing only I am, giving, giving uh, attaching reality only to I am is the wisest course. Is a wise... Believe means we take something to be true. What we should take to be true is only I am, not any, not any object, or not even the subject, because the subject is a subject only so long as it's seeing objects. So only I am, we should put all our trust in I am. That's what Bhagavan implies by saying, don't believe what you don't know. Um, another example you gave was, um, uh, but where uh, Bhagavan advised us to believe that uh, uh, that uh, everything that is going to happen is predestined. Yes, this is something we cannot know. It does require a certain degree of belief. But beliefs can be justified in two ways. The normal way, that is, when we try to justify a belief, we usually try to show that our belief is true. Um, because then only it's justified. If, unless, unless we can, unless we've got evidence or reason to believe it, it's an unjustified belief. So we, that's how we generally try to justify beliefs. But there's another way of justifying a belief. Even if a belief isn't, um, isn't true, whether it's true or not, we don't know, if that belief bestows certain benefits on us, it is reasonable to believe it, even though we cannot be sure that it is true. So what is the benefit of believing that everything is predetermined? Our aim, when we're following Bhagavan's path, our aim is to uh, withdraw our interest from anything other than ourself and be interested only in knowing who am I. In other words, we, we, we need to cease being interested in anything other than who am I? Well, what, what is this I? Um, so in order to, but the problem is, because of our Vishaya Vasanas, we are interested in so many things other than ourselves. So we are not, our aim in the spiritual path, we are trying to wean ourselves off our Vishaya Vasanas. That is, we are trying to, to, to give up, Vishaya Vasanas means the inclination to attend to objects, to anything other than ourselves, to phenomena. So we are trying to lose that inclination. So we must cease to be interested in anything other than I am. That is our aim. If we take everything to be predetermined, uh, there's nothing we can do to change it. Therefore, why should we be concerned about these things? What's going to happen is going to happen. So. The belief in uh, in what Bhagavan has taught us that everything, whatever is going to happen, is a, is predetermined. We cannot change what is going to, what is going to happen to us. That belief is justified. I mean, one justification because Bhagavan has said so. We can take it as true because we trust Bhagavan. Um, that's uh, that is justifying it on the basis of testimony. But another justification. It is very beneficial to take everything as uh, as predetermined because if we leave everything, what is going to happen is going to happen. We 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 are not no longer concerned about what is happening because we can't change it. We can't do anything about it. It's going to happen. So let's forget. Let's not take interest in it. Let's take interest only in knowing I am. So there is a benefit in believing that. So the. Uh, the justification for that belief, besides the fact that we trust Bhagavan's word, the other justification is, but it is a beneficial thing to believe. It's true, and that's uh, that's what I thought when, uh, for example, when you if you thought that you could change your reality, for example, when you face some problems or you yeah. have some difficult, if you have the belief that you're going to be spending 
uh, time and energy time and, and attention. Effort. Exactly, and, and try to change. change. It's going to take years. Maybe yes, some situations yes. are going to take years. It's going to yes. you're going to be frustrated, maybe. Uh, and that, even though you cannot change it, it sounds like yes. fatalistic for yes. some people. Yes. Yeah, in a way, it's more beneficial to, so, to think so like we that. So we believe this, firstly, because Bhagavan says so, and secondly, because it's beneficial. Yeah. But is it real? Is it true? Mm -hmm. In a relative sense, it may be true. But obviously, it's not as true as I am. The one thing that is absolutely true is only I am. So uh, we, we, we lend that idea our belief for the benefit that we will get from it, but we don't, we don't, um, even that belief, it, it's, a, it's a pragmatic belief, it's useful. Okay, is food going to nourish me? The pragmatic option is to believe food is going to nourish you, because if you doubt, oh, no, no, this food, or oh, this food may be poisonous, how can I eat this food? If we doubt every food that is offered to us, if we doubt, it, if we think it's going to poison us, we're going to end up without eating anything, we're going to starve to death. So the pragmatic option is to believe that food isn't poisonous. We may sometimes be proved wrong. Some one day we may eat food but be poisonous and we may die. But, but it's um, we, we know from experience. But generally, if we um, if we uh, when we eat food, we don't die of poisoning. So we we learn to trust food. But food will nourish us. In the same way, if we accept what Bhagavan taught us that everything is predetermined. And lose interest in trying to change our outward life, we will learn from experience that the life goes on perfectly well, whether, whether we believe we have to make whether we believe it depends on our efforts or not. If we accept everything is going on according to destiny, it still goes on. So the, the, um, we, it's um, experience shows it can we can learn from experience if we if we adopt this belief, experience will confirm the belief that things are happening as they're meant to happen. And so, we, we, so long as our interest is withdrawn from other things and we strengthen our interest in just knowing who am I. Because supposing we, whatever else we may know, what is the use of knowing anything else when we don't even know ourselves, the knower? How can, how can anything we know be true or be reliable if we don't even know the truth of the knower? First, we need to know the truth of the knower. If you don't know the color of the glasses you're wearing, how can you judge the color of, of the objects you're seeing? Likewise, until you know the truth of the knower, you cannot know the, until you know the reality of the knower, you cannot know the reality of whatever is known. Yeah, that's like the beginning of the spiritual path in a way, yeah, you know, like yes, yes. starting to doubt the knower rather than the, the known. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. in, but like doubting the knower mm. implies doubting everything that is known. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because, <laughs> because if the knower is not real, how can anything that is known by it be real? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, there are many spiritual paths and teachings and so on. In a way, it's like putting, we put our trust on a teaching or, or a guru. Yeah, or, yeah, or yeah. And uh, anything, yeah, sort of, even if you want, if you want to become a scientist, you yeah. have to put your trust in the science books, in the scientists who went before you. you exactly. We can't repeat all the scientific experiments <laughs> that have been done since the dawn of time. We, we put our trust that uh, those who went before us, they've tested these things and they found that there's, there are certain laws like the law of gravity and um, all these things. And it's all seemed very reasonable. If you take this world to be real, all but all that we read in the science books, it's all reasonable. So it's not a, an improbable thing for us to believe, but we have to take it on trust. We can't test everything. Otherwise, yeah. we'll never learn anything because we'll be yeah. we're, we're testing everything. So we right. all, we, the, the human condition depends on trust. 
So when Bhagavan said, don't believe what you don't know, that is a very, very deep teaching. That is, that is a teaching for those who are ready to let go of everything else and cling only to I am. That is the ultimate teaching, because the only thing we know is I am. Believe only that. Don't believe anything else. If, if you're ready to, to, to not believe anything else, to lose interest in anything else, and to believe only I am, that is, that is you're a very, very uh, uh, mature aspirant. Most of us haven't yet reached that level of maturity. We still, uh, we still believe in the reality of the world. We still believe the world is going to give us happiness. So our mind still goes out. Though we know we've read Bhagavan's teachings and we know theoretically we, we, we've got a, an idea in our mind. Yes, happiness doesn't lie in the external world. Happiness lies only within. But we don't really believe that. If we, we may believe the idea but it's not a deep conviction, because if we really believed it, our mind wouldn't go out. It would go only within. And for science, it's like seems impossible to take that leap, like to go beyond the... Even uh, there are some theories in science that question the reality of the world, but being like a simulation of some other intelligence. There's always higher. some explanation exactly. outside us. Exactly, exactly. It's always Sci about science, someone else. <laughs> science is all that is... One of the basic principles of science, it has to be objective. So long as you believe objects, you are, um, that is the objects, how can we be sure that any object exists independent of the subject's perception of it? But if you believe in the objects, if you believe that the objects exist independent of the subject, and they go even further. They think the subject depends upon the objects. First, you have the objects, and then somehow this subject is produced. Nobody <laughs> has yet found out how, but the mm -hmm. neuroscientists are working very hard to find out how this subject appeared. <laughs> yeah, and they even think, they, I think they, uh, uh, in the future, they, they're talking about the, uh, the, it might be possible to to endow creatures with consciousness or yes. to produce consciousness in robots and yes. uh, artificial intelligence and so on. But so we will be able to produce so many subjects. <laughs> but the problem is nobody has ever experienced more than one subject. More than one, yeah. <laughs> we, every, exactly. we assume other people are subjects, but actually what we know, we all know only one subject. Yeah, but I guess that what they think the what consciousness is is like okay, if you're able to respond logically coherently to me and give responses and have some feelings about that, so you have you are aware. Just, I mean, just if, just like all the people in my dream, they must exactly, be aware by exactly. the same by the same reasoning. Yeah, exactly, but <laughs> some talking that's the same thing. Exactly, yeah. and and that's why, uh, for example, when you when you said that uh, Bhagavan says that. Uh, uh, yeah, of course, awareness, uh, ex um, consciousness is aware of itself. There cannot be two awarenesses, of course. Yeah. Uh, but uh, for example, when science gives a theory or something like the simulation theory or things like that, it, it, it's like the chicken and the egg because it's, I mean, if there is a simulation, okay, there is a creator of the simulation and yeah. who created the, that creator and so on. But uh, the uncost thing is, your consciousness there yes, has to be yes. later at some point there has to be something uncaused yes without a cause yeah yes uh, yeah but out there there is always a creator of something created and yes. that can last for uh, yeah yes if we look for the cause outside ourselves there yeah. will be no end no end yeah science and religion are both making the same fundamental mistake mm -hmm. religion says there's a god who caused all this Science yeah. says there's a Big Bang, but before the Big Bang, well, well you're not quite sure about that, but um, that's as far back as we can go. But there must have been some cause of the Big Bang. Some, some even say, no, the Big Bang had no cause. <laughs> but how can something happen that had no cause? So, lo so long as we're looking outside, we will never find what is the ultimate cause. To find the ultimate cause, we need to look within ourselves. 
And according to Bhagavan, what is the ultimate cause? Only ourself as ego. Our rising as ego is what brings all this into existence. We could say some maybe like this is a simulation of the ego. I mean, it's ego simulation in a way. Yeah, it's a fabric. The, the a word in Sanskrit, the Bhagavan also used is karpana. Mm -hmm. Karpana means it's a fabrication. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so after all, I mean, we could call it simulation. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But simulation, you're simulating something. Again, you've, something, got, yeah, some, true. you've got something <laughs> other than yourself. Why, yeah, right. why to believe in the existence of anything other than ourselves? Because the only thing that is self evidently real, existent, is ourself. Everything else seems to exist in the view of ego, of ourself as ego. And even this ego ceases to exist when we go to sleep. So, Whatever exists at one time, as Bhagavan often used to say, whatever exists at one time and not at another time doesn't exist, even when it seems to exist. But why is that? Because if something is, um, is, uh, if something is intrinsically existent, it must always exist. If it doesn't always exist, it's not intrinsically existent. It's getting it, it's borrowing its existence from something else. All these, all objects borrow their existence from the subject because they seem to exist only in the view of subject. So they borrow their existence from the subject. The subject means ego. And ego, even ego is not, um, is not intrinsically existent because it exists in waking and dream. It doesn't exist in sleep. So ego must be borrowing its existence from something else. From what does it borrow its existence? From what exists in all the three states. That is I am. So the ultimate, the ultimate reality has to be I am. If we think of it deeply, there is no other alternative. So when such is the case, where should our attention be going? Are we after what is real or what is unreal? So long as we go up, so long as we allow our attention to go away from ourselves, we are still fascinated by what is unreal. We're still in love with the unreal. We need to give up our love affair with the unreal and have a, have a love affair with what alone is real. What is real is only I am. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Michael, thank you, so thank you any, very much. In any belief that helps us to cultivate that love for our, that love affair with I am is a beneficial belief. Oh, we can, <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it may not be entirely just. It may not be. Uh, it may not be a, We may not be certain that it's true. We may not know it for certain. But if it if it helps us to de develop love. For to know and to be what we actually are, in other words, I am, then it is a, a useful belief. It's certainly but, better than, than thinking the belief of uh, some Neodvaitin say that, okay, so you, you, are e you are not the ego, you, are, you don't exist, so don't, don't do anything. You don't have to do anything. It's yes, you don't have to do anything. Th that's a belief. You can take <laughs> it on faith too. <laughs> that's what Bhagavan says. You don't have to yeah. do anything. But yeah. can you stop doing anything? But what is the first doing? The rising of ego. <laughs> so to say, oh, you don't have to do anything. When you have risen as ego, to say, oh, it's not necessary to do anything. You are just fooling yourself. Because you've already done something by rising as ego. And so long as we arise as ego and allow our attention to go away from ourselves, we are doing. Attention to anything other than ourselves is a doing. Attention to ourself is a cessation of doing. So in order to do nothing, we need to attend to ourselves. Sorry. There is this, there is also this, uh, I think they call it like the non-doing meditation or something in Zen. The, Maybe, I, I don't know. It's something like, anything. But that's not, I mean, not doing anything like you're going to do it if you're raising as ego. Yes, yes. You've, have you said you're freezing as ego already. So not doing anything with the mind, with your mind, not going anywhere yes. with your mind. The, me the meditator itself is a doing. Is the doer, yeah. Cease to be the meditator. Be as yeah. you are. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Even to meditate, we need to rise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We are there meditating. Yeah. yeah. Sure. As, as ego. We, we cannot meditate in sleep, and we need not meditate in sleep. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michael. So, so the, if you want to meditate, first find out who is a meditator. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the only and <laughs> yes. the only truly objective, uh, the goal, <laughs> the only goal we have to find out. Yes. Mm -hmm. The only objective way to go is subjective. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so maybe there is one the subject. We can call it subjective science in a way. Yes. <laughs> but the trouble is, the word subjective is a very slippery word. Subject, yeah, it's true. Really yeah. Could, um, <laughs> right. A subjective, from... a subjective experience, we say. Exactly. All yeah. experiences are by <laughs> definition object. That is, Every experience has a subject and an object. An object. So, so a subjective experience, this is the trouble with words. Words can be it's used, true. the same words can be used differently in different contexts. Our aim is not to know any objects. Our aim is not even to know the subject, to mm. know the reality of the subject, because the reality of the subject is also the reality of all objects. It is the reality. Full stop. Yes, yeah, no subjectivity, no objectivity in the yeah, end. I mean, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but we can find it only by only when the subject turns its attention back towards itself. Hmm. Can that which is beyond both subject and object be found? Mm -hmm. So long as the subject is looking outwards at objects, it can never find that which is beyond subject and object. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, true. So there's only one way to go, to go back, <laughs> go back the way you came, as Bhagavan said, go back within. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much, Michael. Have, have I answered uh, all the questions? There were so many other... I, uh, I think so. Let me see. You have to stick your screen. How can we reconcile this if we don't... Uh, I can't well, know it. Yes, I, I, I hope I've said, but I mean, mm -hmm. we have to, so long as our mind is going outward, we have to believe something. Let mm -hmm. us believe those beliefs that will help us to turn it back within. Exactly. Let's take it uh, uh, for now. I mean, yes. as something beneficial for our spiritual practice. And the next question was, do we have to stick to our experience to believe only what we know experientially? What we experience we shouldn't trust because we experience so many things mm -hmm. experience experience of anything other than ourselves is to be doubted the only experience we cannot doubt is the fundamental experience i am so that is the only experience we should ultimately we should believe only that any it's other just, uh -huh. It's just because I, I, I've heard, I don't, uh, yeah. it's not my experience, certainly, but I've heard uh, some testimonies from people that say, I haven't, it sound, they sound very auspicious, like, I don't know, like, I, for some, for 30 seconds, oh, I knew that this wasn't my body, or I wasn't this body, or I, I, I think like that. Who knew it? Yeah, that, that's what I mean. If, the I who knew this isn't my body is the I that is identifying itself with this body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So in a way... In fact, you say my body. Who is that I? It's the I that takes this body to be mine. Mm -hmm. That is the same I that is experiencing this body as I. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, all these experiences. You know, there's a wide range, a wide range of experiences yeah. that... A uh, anyone who says anything, any experience... Hmm. It cannot be real. So long as there's an, an experiencer and something experienced, it is not real. But the only experience that is real is the experience in which there is no division between the experiencer and the experience, where there's a, it's a state of perfect oneness and immutability. So it has to be, it has to be as Bhagavan said, it has to be eternal, unchanging and self-shining then only is it real and relatively speaking for example when someone says that uh, they have a near-death experience or something and they saw themselves from the from the ceiling 
and after maybe they come they came back to this body yeah. to this yeah. and they they thought it's they feel better in that sense because they know even though it's they feel to be the body again they have yeah. more they they are not so worried about that because yeah, they know I mean, such experiences often help people have a have mm -hmm. a a certain degree of detachment yeah mm -hmm. that is they they no longer believe but their existence is just limited to this body yeah mm -hmm. but still they've got a limited even though, yeah even because, though it's because, not the final because, experience but final they say they saw their body from outside so they were still low they were That's... still limited in time and space uh -huh, yeah. what did you see anything in time and space you must mm -hmm. occupy a, a location in time and space there's no such thing as a view from nowhere. So the very fact that you have a location means you still have an identity, a physical identity, a physical identity. Yeah, it's just that maybe it may be more uh, sound like a bit of relief for people, or maybe I don't know, an atheist yeah. who doesn't believe in anything, but maybe they're more yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. afraid of uh, losing their body or something. Or... Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. True. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michael, so... So, it, so it, it's very important to understand when we come to Bhagavan's path, mm -hmm. we, our aim is not any kind of experience yes. or not an experience as we know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the experience, the only experience that is real is the experience that is eternal. The only eternal experience is the experience I am. Anything other than I am is not real. However, however, that is when people meditate, they have all sorts of experiences. They experience um, sublime states, they experience peace, they experience silence, so many things. But all these are things that appear and disappear. So they're all objects. What we are trying to experience is who am I? And I can never be an object. So who I am is not something that can appear and disappear. It's what is ever present. And is even now, it, it, it exists and it shines always. So even now we're aware of ourselves as I am. The problem is but we're not just aware I am. We're aware of so many other things. All, our aim is to remove all our experiences so that the basic experience I am alone remains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just because the usually I think that many, maybe unconsciously we think that uh, we measure progress by the kind of experiences we have yeah, in yes, a way. Yes, no? It's yes. like, yeah, like yes. uh, seeing, uh, having less dense uh, experience. That's why Bhagavan of never attached, or... Bhagavan never attached uh, importance to experiences. When people ask Bhagavan about how to know whether I'm progressing, Bhagavan said the only sign of progress is perseverance. So long as you're persevering in trying to turn your attention within, that is the only sign. What, why is that a sign of progress? Because if you truly love to know who you are, you will be trying to turn your attention within. So it's um, that's a practical, um, a practical, uh, uh, as always, whatever Bhagavan says, it's always practical. But some, somewhere it's been recorded, but Bhagavan said, or you can know your progress from the, um, from the degree of peace and freedom from unwanted thoughts. But that's again something other than myself. Oh, now I'm free from unwanted thoughts. Previously, I had so many unwanted thoughts. Now I have less unwanted thoughts. It's again, it, you're describing something other than yourself. It has nothing to do with thoughts. Let's, as Bowman said, what does it matter how many thoughts arise? Has and when each thought arises, to whom does it arise? If we investigate, it'll be clear to me. So many things that have been recorded in books of Bhagavan said this, Bhagavan said that. I think they the people who recorded, they themselves didn't understand properly. So they recorded what, whatever they understood. Yeah, that in a way that, sound, that sounded like a relief to me because it, it, having read many, many things about other teachings and so on, 
and thinking that yes, it's it's all about experiences. I mean, it's as you progress in the path, you certainly is going are going to have uh, different kinds of experiences. And when I when I read that, it was like a relief in a way. That I just have to worry about the final yes. Uh, yes. eradication. That's it. And perseverance and patience and step by step. Little by little. It doesn't matter what you experience or what you just don't experience. Mm -hmm. To whom is this experience? To yeah. whom is this lack of any experience? Mm -hmm. Oh, I haven't. I've been following this path. I haven't had any experiences. Who is that I who hasn't had any experiences? Yeah. Uh -huh. So whether experiences come or don't come, we should be investigating to whom does it come or to whom does it not come? Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that question Bhagavan gave us, that is a, the most powerful question. A simple to whom? To me. That's, that is those, that's such a powerful clue Bhagavan gave us. Whatever may appear, whether it's a, whether you have a divine vision, whether you have sublime peace, whether you have whatever experience may happen, to whom? To me. Who am I? Subside back into your source. Stop looking at all these experiences. Look at the one to whom they appear. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Such a beautiful, beautiful clue Bhagavan gave us. Mm -hmm. But people yeah. misunderstand it and they sit there thinking, when's the next thought going to come? When it comes, I must pop this question. <laughs> to whom is this thought? To me. <laughs> even, I wait for the next thought. And to whom? It's not a matter of questioning. Bhagavan exactly. is, that, that clue Bhagavan gave us is showing, is pointing the direction in which our attention should be turning. I think instead of going out towards the experience, to whom is this experience? We should be turning it back towards ourselves. Mm -hmm. Even even that, uh, don't don't be concerned about thoughts. Whether there are many, there are a uh, few of them, there are none. Don't concern got, with, you've with you've thoughts. Got nothing it's, to do with thoughts. Leave that, thoughts. Let them take very, care of themselves. Exactly. That's a relief to, to me. And it's it like, is. oof. You. I mean, you yeah. can you can have some. I mean, you can have some rest, even with many thoughts, it doesn't matter. It's, it's... So long as we are concerned about thoughts, our attention is going away from ourselves towards the thoughts. Yeah. Why? What does it matter? As Bhagavan said at the end of verse 6 of, um, of uh, Aranach Ashtakam, Nindrida Sendrida Ninevida Vindre. That is... Uh, uh, um, uh, let them appear, let, let them remain or let them go or let them, uh, uh, they are not other than you. So we should be so completely indifferent to thoughts because thoughts are just appearances. To whom do they appear? To me. It's, to, it's that me we should be holding on to, forgetting about the thoughts. Yeah, even, and it's so, um, when we hear some, uh, some other teachings and it's so, in, embedded in other teachings that it's uh, calming your thoughts or the quieting your thoughts your mind is so like yeah. a requisite like yes you, you should have your, your mind should be quiet before yes. going for any further yes. uh, you have to stop your thoughts first and gap to have some bigger gaps between thoughts uh, one thought and the next thought and uh, that is going to be get bigger yeah. but I don't know if, if that would be a, a, an effect yeah. of practice also but Yes, but whether whether thoughts, are, whether the mind is active or not active, mm -hmm. whether the thoughts are there or not, I am. We are always aware of I am. So let us, we should take no interest whatsoever in thoughts. If at all we, that is thoughts, why do thoughts come? To remind us, to whom have they come? Hey, I've come here. Now find out to whom I've come. They're telling us. So if we take the thoughts as a reminder to attend to ourselves, to whom they have appeared, they are our good friends. But if we take them as our enemy, oh no, thoughts have come. My, my, I, I failed in my efforts. Then we are attaching importance to the thoughts. They, yeah. only, they only come to remind us to attend to the one to whom they appear. 
<laughs> yeah, and and I heard uh, some people who say that they practice. They set the alarm clock like every five minutes, so they remember. But that's a, a better way. I think okay, each thought is the thoughts are going to be the alarm. <laughs> yeah, yes. Thought is going to remind me. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, to whom does it? Yeah. <laughs> does the thought come? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point.